The Principle of Hope uh, by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, Chapter five, uh, 6. More mature wishes in their images. These do not have to be any less turbulent, since wishing does not decrease later on. Only what is wished for diminishes. The drive that has grown older aims closer. It knows its way around. It sets itself up in this world, but not as if it were thereby accepting the life that had simply come to it. Precisely what has already become petite bourgeois is half-baked and flat. Something important is missing now just as it was then, so the dream does not stop inserting itself into the gaps. An element of defeat probably also settles in. The flight often dips. An element of vulgarity emerges which, is no, which no longer has healthy red cheeks, but is hard-boiled. But the dreamer believes he has at last found out what life ought to be offering him. The lame nags. First, his wish goes backwards. It makes something good again. The dream pictures what would have happened if a silly move had been avoided, if a clever move had not been missed. Lame nags and good ideas come last. This is wit on the, st on the stairs. It torments because it has missed the opportunity, and what has been missed is thus retrospectively activated and articulated in the imagination. This imagination contains both regret and longing together. The regret makes it into a wishful dream which improves on the past. In the wishful dream of wet on the stairs, blows are landed which the dreamer did not have the courage to land at the time they were due. The wishful dream of wit on the stairs makes losses good by going back to that point in time where it was still possible to avoid them. With bitter enjoyment it savors profits which would certainly have been made if we had gone into the business at the right time. We drank the wrong brand. How wisely we choose the right one in the dream or in the subsequent account, with which we not only fool other people, or the source of the fiber down which all our hopes were dashed is imagined as a tap. We turn it off ret retrospectively, as if everything were as good as could be. Regret is a feeling that persists in the bourgeois world, but now almost exclusively in business life, so regretful dreams mostly revolve around money that has been lost. But amidst these dreams, there is still room amongst the petit bourgeois for the heroic pose, the one they did not strike at the right time, and the thundering phrase that just did not flash out at the time. The dream plays out what is wishful for as it could have been, what is right as it should have been. All boasting is part of this. All stupid pride follows this course. And the memory that the reality was different gives way to suit the vanity of our wishes. Night of the Long Knives Not so far from here are the various dreams that are fond of getting their own back. They are particularly delicious. Revenge is sweet when merely imagined, but also shabby. Most men are too cowardly to do evil, too weak to do good. The evil that they cannot or cannot yet do, they enjoy in advance in the dream of revenge. The petite bourgeoisie in particular has traditionally been fond of the fist clenched in the pocket. This fist characteristically thumps the wrong man, since it prefers to lash out in the direction of least resistance. Hitler rose out of the night of the long knives. He was called by the masters out of the dream of this night when he became useful to them. The Nazi dream of revenge is also subjectively bottled up, not rebellious. It is blind, not revolutionary rage. As for the so-called iron broom, the hatred of the immoral life of others and those at the top, middle-class virtue, as always in such cases, was here merely betraying its dearest dream. Just as, just as with its revenge, it does not hate exploitation, but only the fact that it is not itself an exploiter, so virtue does not hate the slothful bed of the rich, but only the fact that it has not become its own and its alone. This is what the headlines have always aimed at in those papers which love to see read, the gutter press. The truth, latest news, broilers at Wertheim's store, the harem in the Tiergarten Tier villa, sensational revelations. But they are only revelations concerning the outrage of the bourgeois conformist himself, both regarding wartime raking in the shekels and regarding Jewish lechery. Hence the immediate impulse to set oneself up 
in place of the eliminated wartime after an act of retribution, which in the supposedly detested fraud merely replaces the subject which is practicing it. The malicious and brutal aspect of this, the repulsiveness of this kind of wish, as pervasive as the smell of urine, has always characterized the mob. This mob can be bought, is absurdly dangerous, and consequently it can be blinded and used by those who have the means and who have a real vested interest in the fascist pogroms. The instigator, the essence of the Knights of the Knives, was, of course, big business. But the raving petit bourgeois was the astonishing, the horrible, seducible manifestation of this essence. From it emerged the terror, which is the poison in the average man on the street, as the petit bourgeois is now called in American, a poison which has nowhere near been fully excreted. His wishes for revenge are rotten and blind, God help us, when they are stirred up. Fortunately, though the mob is equally faithless, it is also quite happy to put its clenched fist back into its pocket when crime is no longer allowed a free night on the town by those at the top. Shortly before the closing of the gate. But how is the most ordinary kind of life, the quiet everyday kind, transformed through dreams? Let us leave the vengeful wishes. There are besides them also warm, harmlessly foolish and colorful dreams. In general, the little man who is not class conscious is, con is content just to rearrange his lot slightly. He does not change anything, but he temporarily pours out the dishwater of his previous existence, which has seemed so unsatisfactory. His waking dreams remain private. Sexual dreams are particular favorites, followed by business dreams. Both are effervescent. Solitary walks give these images room. Novels of his own composition begin to be woven, involving his ego. They are no longer young, no longer full of super... They are no longer young, no longer full of Superman, Dreamship, Prince Admiral, but they are sufficiently adventurous to garnish his usual fried egg and chips beyond all recognition. The reticent man or the man in a mediocre marriage enjoys the pleasures of an accomplished lover. Kindled imagination serves up double or treble, por treble portions. Inexhaustible powers are at his command. There are so-called joke cards on which a naked woman appears as a balloon, weightless, totally flexible, to be used for any purpose. Thus the calypso of the deprived babbit is hallucinated as unresisting in a higher sense. Usually there are several images, a mixture of free love and harem, full of trained women, in interchangeable positions and groups, some of them being defiled, others looking on, a dream forest of randy eyes and spread legs. Normally, the imagined harem is stocked with these women whom the, whom the well-behaved, often also impotent lecher, has failed to secure in life. But of course, excess alone does not satisfy him, even that of the so luxuriantly matured wishes. Because a man is not made for love alone, so the waking dream of the bourgeois conformist also becomes practical. Younger powers must be given their head. And so in his wishes, he is himself these powers and experienced as well. There is still room for improvement in blossoming communities. So the dreaming walker plucks up speculative courage. Long ago in his dream, he bought the thriving shop on the corner, expanded it, brought it up to date. Long ago, he became a town councillor, a man to whom many who now scarcely give him the time of day doff their hats. Long ago, the shop was sold again. The great world takes him on board as it is shown in the films. The hunting lodge in the forest, the castle by the sea, his own yacht. Everything almost as it was in puberty, only now furnished with money instead of ideals. To his ever alert but now sedate longing, a group of purchasable comforts present, present themselves. Imagined in detail, but unpossessed. In this forest, there is a different ending for him than in the forest of youth. Beyond the tropical sea, though, through uh, beyond the tropical sea through which the yacht is plowing, stands the beach casino where people are gambling. But the private dreams of a more mature kind, evidently, do not cease to be foolish one moment, exotic the next. Although they develop more past material than future more that is familiar and which simply has not been allotted to the dreamer than defiant premonition. 
The imminent closing of the gate, both sexually and in terms of business achievements, plays its part, especially as make way for efficiency is at an end anyway, at least in the world which coined this slogan, the capitalist world. The little man, the petit bourgeois, proletarianized, but without proletarian consciousness, thus dreams considerably more castles in Spain than the bourgeois man of property who knows what he has. The latter in his thoughts tends to swim along with the current of what has already been achieved. The little man, on the other hand, finds only traces around him and kicks over them. Even if only in the silence of his imagination, as long as there is no Pied Piper on hand, or as long as he does not see through the conditions of his disgruntlement. He exercises this imagination through images which shimmer towards him out of the solarium of life which he has never entered. Invention of a new pleasure. Most people in the street look as if they are thinking about something else entirely. The something else is predominantly money, but also what it could be changed into. Otherwise, it would not be so easy to lure with jewelry, to attract with a beautiful figure. The flaneur would not exist, nor everyone's persisted, persistent inclination to turn themselves into one. In this way, the shopping street is also steeped in dreams, not just the more rural walk or the hustle and bustle of the suburbs. A woman stands in front of the shop window, looking at lizard skin shoes trimmed with chamois leather, a man goes past, looks at the woman, and so both of them have a share of the wishful land. There's enough happiness in the world, only not for me. The wish tells itself this wherever it goes. And it thus also demonstrates, of course, that it merely wishes to break out of the world somewhat, not that it wants to change it. The employee, the petit bourgeois of whom we are talking here, this in no way regular, but increasingly regularized social stratum, contents itself with the needs which are awoken by the window displays dressed for it. This unites all bourgeois dreams, and yet it still rations them, even in more distant excursions to the over-blue coast of the travel agents and beyond, so that they do not explode the given world. People with wishes of this kind live beyond their own means, but never beyond the generally existing means. If this is true of the employee in middle age, and with the until now so cloudy consciousness of the middle class, then the upper middle class citizen, whose means are sufficient, certainly does not have any reason, even in his wildest dreams, to explode the existing world. He finds it easiest to give up youthful ideals, to apply his will solely to what is attainable. To pull his weight efficiently, standing right in the middle of gainful employment, which really is that, full of plans promising profit, but on the whole, without that element which, usually with contempt, he calls utopian. Since the rich man, in contrast to the salary earner, can indulge in his every wish, he has, so to speak, no definite, that is, long-cherished and thus fully developed wishes at all. And yet, although it is only the left-hand side which is studied here on menus of every kind, and not, as in the case of the employee, the right-hand side, where the price is given, Precisely this affluence causes a quite specific producer of more nature, of more mature, now sedate wishes to appear, instead of deprivation, boredom. No speed, no luxury, no coast, however blue, helps to escape it. Even the excitements of gambling go stale eventually. This fog of boredom swirls in the abyss of possession, and the peak, because it is not one, does not rise above it. The wishes, which nevertheless do rise above it, are solely those of the urgently longed-for thrill, of the snobbish butterfly, of fashion and its changes, provided they are not too gaudy. Of course, fresh styles are also continually produced for the masses, so, there, so that there is a turnover, which is not yet ensured by shoddy production alone. But the incentive came first from those at the top, and is older than the pleasure and turnover. The rich man who otherwise is nothing and can do nothing. The rich man, in the rarer and rarer guise of a gentleman of leisure, sees to it that boredom is at least made interesting. Xerxes was already offering a prize for the invention of a new pleasure. In its more modern form, this escape attempt turns away from mere fat capital towards snobbery, or even towards eccentricity, 
A rich Englishman traveled through all the countries where pointed archers or arches occurred to photograph them. This is how bourgeois wishes end, at least those of private life, for ordinary people, so that they also want to cut their slice of the available cake without changing bakers, as Brecht puts it in his uh, Three Penny Opera. In the case of the rich, these wishes necessarily end bizarrely, that is, increasingly boosted into increasing triviality. Opportunity to be friendly. Even the non-bourgeois dreamer likes many things that the others have, but essentially he imagines a life without exploitation. This must be attained. He is not the limpet stuck fast, having to wait for what chance brings to it. He overhauls the given world, both in actions and in dreams. The happy existence which he anticipates lies behind smoke, behind the smoke of a powerful change. The world which then appears is likewise changed. No Babbitt has any place in it, or stretches himself out comfortably into the rotten laziness, the lazy rottenness that he is. It is not that comfort itself is dubious, or limited to its bourgeois form. To each his chicken in the pot and two cars in the garage, that is also a revolutionary dream, not just a French or American or general human dream. But the values of comfort are... Sorry, but the values of comfortable happiness shift in the prospects of the revolutionary wishful dream, if only because happiness no longer arises out of the unhappiness of others and measures itself against it. Because our fellow man is no longer the barrier to our freedom, but rather the means by which this freedom is truly achieved. Instead of freedom of acquisition, there shines freedom from acquisition. Instead of imagined pleasures of cheating in the economic struggle, there shines the imagined victory in the proletarian class struggle. And even higher above this shines the distant peace, the distant opportunity of being in solidarity and being friendly with all men, an opportunity for the sake of which the struggle moves in the distant goal. The turmoil in which all this still lies admittedly makes the individual non-bourgeois dreams considerably less distinct than those which need only reach into existing window display. No department store sends a list out to them. There is no patron who realizes these dreams from above. Instead, they are characterized not only by an incomparably higher status, but also by an expectation of the unknown, a blueprint of the unrealized which the bourgeois wishful image of more mature years no longer possesses at all.